Welcome to Football Geeks. My guest this evening takes us on a journey across territory less trodden. Is the author of a new book which explores and celebrates a tournament rarely covered by polarised Western journalists, the African Cup of Nations. It gives me enormous pleasure uh, to welcome to Football Geeks this evening, Mr. Ben Jackson. Hello, Ben. Hi, Phil. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, you're more than welcome, mate. So let's talk about this fantastic book. So uh, tell everyone uh, the, the title of the book uh, and then, then tell us what compelled you to write it, put it. Sure, yeah. So it's the Africa Cup of Nations uh, history of an underappreciated tournament, uh, which I hope, yeah, clue guesses in the title in terms of what my kind of opinion on, on the Africa Cup of Nations is. But yeah, I think it was one of those books where for me i've always been really interested in african history i studied kind of african politics as a, a master's level so for me kind of african history politics and then my love of football i was like i could just blend this all into one and <laughs> write a book about the african cup of nations but i was like oh, surely someone someone must have done this before but when i had a look and i just couldn't find any not, not in english at least or many like kind of up to date that covered the whole tournament so i was like oh maybe maybe a little of me could give it a go and see if i can put something together because for me i was like well part of the fun of it was just researching and doing all the research anyway because i'm learning the story at the same time so yeah it all came together into into this book and thankfully pitch we're very happy to to take it on so yeah and now now i'm here speaking to people <laughs> about it which just seems a little bit crazy amazing i mean like, like we said before we came on the air it is a, it is a bit niche but i love niche i absolutely love anything that's slightly kind of off curve and, and has never been touched before and this certainly kind of uh it ticks those boxes so it is an unappreciated tournament that's for sure C can you give uh listeners an overview of the tournament when it started and and some of the early kind of uh forces within the african game sure yeah so it all kind of starts just late kind of like 50s post world war ii sort of era where african kind of states themselves are starting to kind of push away from colonialism with kind of getting these this independence movement starting to happen but just before that there is this push to kind of get african football recognized at the at fifa at least and for a long time it hadn't they didn't really have any representation within fifa they were kind of seen as this lesser kind of continent that needed to be taught how to do everything which is kind of like these colonial like tendencies um that played into that so you have Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia, and South Africa coming together as being like, we want to be part of FIFA, we deserve to be part of FIFA. They eventually, after kind of a lot of touring and throwing, they get part of that. And during one of the meetings in Lisbon, they all get together and say, we should host our own continental tournament. Um, so they agree to it. There's going to be a four team tournament. They start doing the draws and everything like that. Eventually, after a couple of like changes around, it gets decided it'll be, it'll be hosted in Khartoum in Sudan. Uh, but then South Africa for a spanner in the works and start saying we're only going to bring a team that's either going to be completely white or uh, a coloured team. We will not bring a mixed team. At which point, both of the the other nations who are very kind of pro, starting to be a little more pro, like pan African, pan kind of anti-colonial movements, are saying that's just not acceptable. You are not allowed to take part in the tournament. So the fourteen tournament becomes a three-team tournament uh, between Sudan, Ethiopia um and egypt and listeners are probably thinking ethiopian sudan like never really heard of them when it comes to kind of footballing senses uh maybe like long distance running when you think of ethiopia but you don't really think of them as a footballing nation and the same with sudan really but these are the three teams that start the tournament and naturally egypt dominate uh the first couple of uh editions well at least the first two editions because this is a team that's been playing football long before the other two they go to the Olympics in the 1920s, the first African football team to do that. So they get to the the first tournament as, as heavy favourites, but because of the way the draw's gone, it's only three teams. So two teams need to play a semi-final and the, one of the teams is already into the final. Um, so poor Sudan are the kind of, don't really win out on the kind of draw there. So they have to play against Egypt. Um, they lose and then Ethiopia lose to Egypt in the final. And kind of the, the big name of that, Kind of tournament i guess that people probably don't know unless you're egyptian is uh ad diba uh ad diba he scores four goals in the final which is just incredible uh he scores a couple of, as well before that i think so he, th he finishes this two game tournament with five goals and then never plays in the africa cup of nations again he just completely disappears from playing he does come back in 1968 as a referee um and i think i make mention in the book as like 
I don't think you could name any players in the modern era that are going to be coming back as referees. I think this that, that transition is never going to happen. Um, there's a couple of other players I kind of wanted to kind of talk about at the beginning as well, uh, mainly from Sudan and Ethiopia, because like I said, you just don't think of these sides as footballing nations. So for Ethiopia, you have uh, Nasir Eddin Abbas, uh, usually known as, as Jaxa or Jaxa, uh, probably the best player Sudan ever produced um, in their history. This is the guy that he had links to Boca Juniors, Bayern Munich. There's a kind of a story about him and this guy, a Lufthansa pilot or the owner of Lufthansa being like, you're going to come and play for Bayern. And he's like, yeah, sure, I'll do that. But then ends up just remaining in Sudan for his entire career. Um, and then Ethiopia, you have a couple of players. You've got Menjitsu Worku. Um, he scores a couple of goals. He also helps the side win their only Africa Cup of Nations victory uh, in the early 1960s and a couple of other of them. But... I think Worker and Jaxa, for me, they're kind of the epitome of the early era of African Cup of Nations because they never leave the countries that their domestic leagues, they always play there, but they're some of the best players on the continent. But unlike today, where we see lots of players probably never play in their domestic leagues for their countries, these guys stayed there the whole whole time as well. Um, so the early tournaments, I think they were kind of really, really interesting for me, seeing how kind of the game emerges and stuff like that. And yeah, I just some of these players that i'd never heard of that you get to discover that are kind of legends of these nations that just don't have footballing history that we think of today but they really really do and they do have a rich footballing history in sudan and ethiopia um yeah i think maybe a couple of early games that people might be interested in uh or that have kind of some some like kind of big moments in the early tournaments we look at the 1963 tournament uh which is where ghana finally appear and Ghana of the 60s are one of the best teams. And I kind of dedicated a whole chapter to this 1960s Ghana side because they are kind of one of the big independence movers uh, in Africa at the time. Like Kwame Nkrumah is so passionate about football. And he sees football as this kind of force to kind of project African kind of ability to do things by themselves and show the world what we can do. And he's like, the Black Stars, they are the team that can do that. Um, but in 1960, they're actually very kind of... I guess they could say they were quite happy to their massive rivals, Nigeria, uh, because Egypt's obviously massive at the time, coming in as, again, one of the favourites in 1963. They play against Nigeria in the opening game, and it's 5-0 after about 60 minutes. Egypt are just absolutely romping to victory until Nigeria just suddenly score three goals at the end uh, to make it 6-3, which when you look at it, you're like, well, I'm sure it's not too relevant. But by the end of that kind of group stage, it costs Egypt a place in the final. Uh, in the end, it's Sudan that meet Ghana and Ghana beat Sudan. And it's always one of those moments in history where you're like, what would have happened if it had been Egypt and Ghana instead of Egypt, uh, instead of Sudan and Ghana? Like, would that have changed anything that happened? Um, and I guess the following tournament's really interesting as well, in my opinion, the 1965 final between Ghana and Tunisia, where Ghana go to Tunisia, the, final, the uh, finals are hosted there, and they defend their title in extra time with a 3-2 win over again, against the hosts. Uh, they say Kofi, Frank Adoy, two of their great, great players from that era scoring there. And it kind of sets up what becomes like the rest of the kind of AFCON history in that you're now, uh, when you get through the 60s, you just get all these teams kind of coming in that we know of because the independence movements are happening, that teams are kind of emerging out of colonial rule. So, yeah, these early tournaments are fascinating and they're just they are the precursor for what we know today. Yeah, I mean, they are fascinating tournaments. I mean, what they didn't have... I mean, they, there's like political stories there, and like, like that kind of there's uh, po political visibility, but there wasn't actually football visibility. You'd never actually saw an African side uh, until uh, around around the uh, the seventies when when the uh, you dedicate a chapter to the story of Zaire. Well, of course they they won the uh, tournament in '68, didn't they? As Congo Kinshasa. Uh, but then there was huge political upheaval, wasn't there? Do you want do you want to tell us about the story of Zaire because it's an incredibly colourful one? Yeah, I think Zaire one of those most interesting kind of teams from the sixty late sixties and early seventies, and I have to say I've got to give kind of kudos to I think Neil Andrews wrote a fantastic book called Zaire seventy four, 
uh, where he really just kind of, he basically dispels the myth that these guys couldn't play and they didn't know the rules, uh, which was kind of the thing that emerged after the World Cup, didn't it? Because yeah. of the incidents with the free kick and kind of... Uh, yeah, a long, a longer, wasn't it? He, he, yeah. He hung at the wall and yeah, yeah all that sort of stuff where it's like these guys don't even know the rules but like they definitely knew the rules and i think yeah Neil, neil's book's really really good and does that kind of world cup story a lot of justice um but looking at it more in kind of the africa cup of nations standing like you kind of see again like with you can kind of see with Nkrumah in ghana like in kwame Nkrumah, there's a leader of ghana really pushes the football side and mabutu kind of recognizes that as he comes into power he's like yeah no this this could work for me as well. And we all know about kind of his relationship with sporting events. Obviously we know about the rumble in the jungle and things like that, but he kind of, I call it the, uh, like the Zara nization of, of AFCON in the book, because one of Mobutu's things is when he comes in, he wants to kind of get rid of all the colonial kind of era history and stuff. And he changes it. He wants to, everything to be kind of Africanized or made into this Zaire as, as the country is called, but they still have Yugoslavian football coaches <laughs> at the same time. So yeah. he, he still kind of realizes that, yeah, actually we still need a little bit of kind of this extra assistance from outside. Um, Vidinic obviously is the one that everyone remembers from the World Cup, but before him we had Ferenc uh, Stasnadi and he comes in and helps them win the 1968 uh, final. They beat Ghana, obviously Ghana at that time, they were going for a, a three-peat, but uh, the, the DRC as we know them now actually kind of overcome them in that one but then it's kind of disappointing that this team is very very good and uh Mobutu's kind of he's brought lots of players back to the country uh from elsewhere and kind of said you need to play domestically and he's like I um, don't really know many instances where like the government of a state has actually bought players up like officially uh, obviously we know kind of with some of the clubs around now that like, the states are very much funding them and kind of state-backed clubs but this is very much no the nation's buying them back to come and play domestically so they can play for the national team um but then they go into the 1970 tournament and they're just awful they're really really bad and they completely drop kind of any semblance of being a dominant african nation ghana get instant revenge in the opening game they then lose i think they draw 2-2 with guinea and they have to kind of really fight for their lives to get the draw against guinea they then lose to egypt who at that time are called the united arab republic um finish bottom of the group and they crash out um so at that point they bring in vidinich and that's when things start to change again for the better because he just had some success as well uh, with morocco but now he kind of brings that success to zaire um they finished fourth in the uh in the 1972 uh, final in the final sorry they lose to mali uh who were quite a good mali inside at the time but kind of what rubs mabutu a little bit is seeing the other congo as we'll mm. probably call them in this one winning yeah. that final the only time they win the final i think the 1972 final is really interesting for me because it pits congo against mali and mali are one of those sides that as I did went through the book and did the research, that I just feel they always fall a little bit short. They're very good at getting to semi-finals, but they can never quite push through. And this was their chance to really win a, a tournament. This was their best chance, and they lost to Congo, who I think they only qualify for five tournaments after that. And only one one of those, I guess, is because they won the 1972 tournament. So they completely like fall away after this victory. But for for Zaire, they they've kind of announced themselves a little bit back now and it, we get into 1974 they're obviously going to the world cup and at that point afcon and the world cup are kind of happening at the same time um so for some teams it's quite good because it's a nice kind of chance to get together chance to kind of work on things before going to the world cup for a lot of managers down the line it actually costs them their jobs um i know that uh, stephen keshi when he was manager of togo he has such a bad afcon in 2006 that he never gets to go to the world cup uh with the togolese in germany but Obviously, Zaya do very, very well in the 1974 finals. Um, Mabuti does put a little bit of pressure um, as they're going through the tournament, saying that if they make the final, he's going to come and watch, um, which if you know the history of Mabuti and what he's like, you probably don't really want him to see you not win. Um, it'd be quite a terrifying situation, as the players find out in a couple of months' time. But they they open that tournament with a loss to, the, to Congo, but they beat Guinea, then poor Mauritius uh, get to the finals and they just get hammered by everyone, mm -hmm. uh, Zaya including. And in that kind of tournament, we really see uh, Ndai Malamba kind of come to the fore as a player. He had a couple of nicknames. They called him the Volvo uh, or Untumbala, uh, which actually means assassin 
Um, I'm not sure which one of those I prefer. I feel they're quite <laughs> different things, Volvos and Assassins. Um, but he finishes uh, the, the tournament with nine goals, which is pretty impressive when you consider it's a much smaller tournament than we have today. Um, they get through to the semi-finals and they have a really, really tough game against host Egypt. They come through there even though they go down, but um, Lambert, the Volvo, he he delivers once again, get to the final, it's against Zambia. Um, and the 74 final is probably one of the most unique finals in AFCON history, or maybe even international footballing history, um, because we get a replay and we don't normally get those, but the game ends 2-2. Zambia score with literally the last kick of the game in extra time. Uh, it's a really great goal, actually. You can It is on YouTube, so you can actually come back and watch some of these games. Um, and the crowd was slightly more Zambia, um, when you watch it back, the kind of the Egyptian crowd were kind of cheering for Zambia a little bit more than they were for Zaire. Um, Malamba actually scores twice in, in the first final, I guess you can say, and then they come back a couple of days later. Uh, Muhammad Ali's in the crowd as well, and he watches them. They win 2 0. Malamba scores again. So technically, he scores four goals in an AFCON final, just kind of spread yeah. over two matches and two days. Um, so they come off this this great win and the feeling is quite good and then it just all kind of dis dissipates when they get to the 74 finals it's just the world cup final sorry it just kind of everything seems to go wrong they, they play reasonably well in their opening game uh against scotland um they kind of struggle a little bit with the physicality but they they can play and people have like watched the games back and said these guys could definitely play but there was just too much political stuff going around like the people there was like a massive entourage of people and it was just a little bit confusing and by the end Vidinich isn't even picking his own team he's got kind of outside interference and all that and yeah you get to that kind of the Yugoslavia games kind of the, the bit where it just completely falls apart and poor old Malamba kind of he gets sent off even though it wasn't him that made that kick the referee it was uh where we longer so as you said earlier but then for malamba in a couple of years later he also gets another kind of case of mistaken identity uh so in 1998 at the afcon they hold a minute silence for him because everyone's like oh he's, he's died in an angolan mining incident but the man's alive in south africa the whole time so he's sat there like well i'm, I'm still alive um <laughs> Tragically, he's living in, in kind of a township and he's like falling completely on hard times. He suffered from, there was like an attack on his family uh, while he was in the DRC, which is why he ends up in South Africa, basically in hospital, gets discharged and then just ends up living there before he does eventually return. But the poor man, he has this double incident of kind of mistaken identity. One of the best players to play for Zaire in recent history. Um, unfortunately, kind of the reason they were good or like being able to be good was because of the support Mobutu gave them. But they go back in 1974 after that World Cup, and that's that's basically the end of, of Mobutu's support for the Leopards. He's just embarrassed by them. But it's kind of his own doing at the same time. Um, and they've never really come that much closer. They, they've had a couple of kind of third place finishes in 98 and 2015, but they've not really had a full comeback. So they're one of those sides that I'd love to see come back because they should have been able to go on with, with the kind of massive population they have some really good footballing teams domestically they really should be like a premier african side but it's just the political interference just always seems to get in the way for them yeah they've got a shot at it this year and they just, just they've just beaten egypt in the last 16 so they've got to be amongst the favorites with all the other teams falling away there's some big teams have fallen away this time haven't they uh, the malamba thing it reminds me of uh, uh, George Bernard Shaw when he read his obituary in the paper and, and said, uh, yeah, reports of my death have been highly exaggerated. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's a crazy story, but it's, uh, it's, it's a very, uh, very amusing one. So going into, into sides that really excite uh, in the African uh, Cup of Nations, uh, I asked you to pick the three sides who you, uh, you, you cho choose as your three greatest AFCON uh, sides of all time would you like to run us through those big sure um so i took this a little bit a little bit subjectively so i went for one that i consider the best and then two that i just love the story and like kind of everything around it so i, I couldn't really ignore the the egypt team of the 2000s i think that was just yeah, yeah. The, the winning three in a row is just it's incredibly difficult and no one's defended their title since 2010 like no one's been able to come back and do it again since this team did it uh under shahata and he just he wasn't really even the first choice to be the coach going into that home tournament in 2006 they kind of were like okay fine we'll, we'll give him a go he's not afraid to make some big decisions during that tournament as well like 
everyone knows Mido or probably remembers Mido, the Tottenham, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Tottenham forward, who was kind of one of the poster boys of this team as well. But during one of the games, he just yanks him off because he's like, he's not, he's not doing what we want. But he's on Amazaki, who Wigan fans will probably fondly remember as well. And he just scores a decisive goal. But before then, Mido's already had a go at Shahato and they've kind of fallen out. He apologises and the FA send Mido home. And it's all this big drama around it. But Jahata just seems to deal with all these things. He's just the, the team is this collective group of players that are just really, really good. And they loads of them play kind of domestically for Zamalek or Al Ali, who are massive rivals, but he he brings them together and they win at home in 2006, which you can say, well, fair enough, like North African sides are very, very good north of the Sahara. They they normally do quite yeah, well. Yeah. Egypt at home will always be a strong side. It's when they come to sub-Saharan Africa that like, they get south of that desert and they just can't seem to, to play like they normally do. And we've seen it in this tournament. They've all gone home. All the North African teams out before yeah, they've yeah. even reached reached the end of the tournament. But this is this Egypt team were different. They go to Ghana, um, they win in Ghana, and then they go to Angola and they win in Angola. Um, and each time they do it. They've got this core team, but Shahata just seems to pick these strikers up and fit them into this system and just get the best out of them. And he gets them some great moves. So, like, Mohamed Zidane isn't there uh, in the initial one, but he comes in 2008, he introduces him, and he's one of the kind of linchpins of that team that gets them through. Gedo, people might remember, he had a brief spell in the Premier League, I think with Hull City. Didn't really do much, but in the AFCON, he was just fantastic at coming off the bench and he scored I think, the winner, didn't he? And one of them scored the winner, yeah. Yeah, and always late as well. Like he always scored. There was, I think, the run of he wouldn't score before the 80th minute. It felt yeah, like he yeah. was always coming in and scoring late. Uh, but behind them, they had like Abu Troika, who's just he was one of my favorite players to go back and watch. He was just amazing. Ahmed Hassan as well. They just felt so kind of cohesive and they felt that this massive belief that they were always going to win. And then it's kind of the post 2010 they just completely fall apart don't qualify for a couple of tournaments and they're slowly rebuilding and kind of if you're looking at someone like Mohamed Salah you're like if only he'd been born like a little bit earlier and stuck into that era he might yeah. have won a couple more but that kind of the contrast between that that Egypt of the 2000s to the Egypt of now you just they just don't seem as cohesive as they were and I think that team for me is probably one of the best especially because by the time you get to that era of African Cup of Nations football like you've got players playing all over the world and it's kind of very international tournament yeah. so it's even more difficult with the level of quality that's there um another kind of the second team I picked only one at once but the story is just beautiful and I think most people will agree um who know the story the Zambia 2012 victory yeah. that's just it's just such a wonderful story that kind of uh, not really similar to Egypt in the sense that I don't think the, the team individually was good, but it was that collective group of players that like there was no superstar in that team, and they never none of them have gone on to become superstars. None of them have really gone on to do anything massive in in kind of European football. I guess we could say um, there was a couple of players that came over and did play for a couple of teams, but nowhere near kind of the level of the competition that they were facing in the 2012 tournament, but. For people who don't know, obviously, in 1993, there's a tragic plane crash uh, just off the coast of Gabon. Zambia lose basically what they consider to be their golden generation, the team that they believe would have qualified for a World Cup and probably won an Africa Cup of Nations in the 90s. Maybe Nigeria might have had something to say about that because the Nigeria team of the 90s was very, very good. And if they'd yeah. actually played in a couple more, they might have made this, uh, this, this list. But... Unfortunately, they lose all these players and yeah, you'll have to read the book to kind of see how they kind of bring it all back together and kind of regalvanize. It's a fascinating story, but this 2012 tournament's then going back to Gabon and you kind of look back at it now and you think, well, it's just felt like an inevitability that this team were going to win. Um, but it was kind of Herve Renard, the French head coach, just really bought into what this tournament meant for that team and for that nation. And he just seemed to understand it. And he created this incredible atmosphere that the players just felt completely relaxed, but believed they were going to win at the same time. Um, there's some fantastic performances from the likes of Kennedy Buini in goal, uh, scoring penalties, saving penalties. Like he does everything in this tournament. Chris Katongo, Rainford Calaba, like these are fantastic players. And even in the most recent tournament, uh, Stopila Sunzu was still playing for Zambia in 2024, <laughs> which I think is ridiculous that he's still going. But he's obviously the one that scores the winning penalty against the likes of Drogba uh, and the Torre brothers. They they take down this Cote d'Ivoire side that everyone thought were going to win. And it's not the prettiest of finals winning on penalties, but it's the story around it that's just so beautiful. And 
one of the only real surviving players of that generation that died, uh, Kalusa Bradia, is then kind of head of the FA and he gets to kind of before the final, they lay flowers near the beach where it happened and then he gets to kind of lift the trophy, which he probably should have done because he's one of the best players in African kind of Cup of Nations history yeah, uh, in yeah. terms of scoring goals and stuff. So they're number two. And then the final one is a, a similar kind of story that I guess people will will probably know or be interested in reading more about is South Africa uh, in 1996. They finally get there, as we said, kind of at the beginning, apartheid era kind of means then they're just not allowed to play in the African Cup of Nations. All the teams are saying no. FIFA try and kind of push back and get CAF to kind of reintegrate them into the system. But that's when kind of the Havilage kind of election happens and Sasani Ru gets kind of kicked out because the African nations are like, you, you can't interfere in this situation for us. But they finally come back when Mandela kind of gets uh, gets put into power and then they're like kind of welcomed back in and they're playing massive catch up with all these nations. They get to host in 96 because of, I think Kenya decide they don't want to host because it's coming up to elections. And they don't want kind of to ruin what's happening there. Um, Nigeria aren't there. So a lot of Nigerians argue that this one doesn't actually count because their great team wasn't there. But we just have to take it as what happened in, in the tournament. But I really enjoyed kind of retracing the steps of that tournament from kind of the end of apartheid era South Africa right up to the final 96 and kind of the, every player seems to have they say every player had like a Mandela story of when they met him things he said to them and stuff like that and he'd come to the hotel before matches and like he was kind of this inspiration for them um and it is amazing I think I've just said it to so many people as you watch the kind of the rugby world cup final which has obviously been made into a film and all that sort of stuff and you look at the crowd there and then you go and look at the crowd in the 96 football final and it's just so different because it's just the 96 final is the rainbow nation in all its essence because it's just completely mixed crowd all hugging and celebrating together as they they win this tournament that they scarcely believe they could um and there's just some fantastic players in that in that team as well like mark fish uh john mishre uh nicknamed shoes scores a couple of fantastic goals he tragically dies i think he's only like in his 40s when he dies um but he was playing football i think up to a week before he an illness to, took his life so he never kind of lost that love for the game uh, that we all have so those are my three i mean people will say that south africa and zambia probably aren't the greatest teams in african history but i think they have two of the greatest stories yeah i think the south africa one it seemed like the whole nation was, was pushing them forward wasn't it it was an incredible achievement both in the rugby and the football uh, and they're still in the tournament this time of course yeah. they, they've just uh, beaten morocco so they do appear to be the most dangerous of dark horses in this tournament uh, i've been watching it with great interest it's been a good tournament so far uh i, I want cape verde to win but they won't they won't it'll <laughs> be know. it'll Never be know. nigeria i think yeah. nigeria. <laughs> i'm hoping for democratic republic of congo as well because that'd be a nice kind of it would be a nice circle for them to to kind of eventually mm. come back and win it again and they'd be the first nation to win it under three separate guises because we've got egypt and the uar haven't we? but uh but yeah they, they, they'd go uh they'd go one better with this one so some great great players some great sides there uh in your opinion though ben how does african football compare with football on the other continents i mean we talked earlier that it, it it's suffered through i don't know not an inferiority complex it's just i think it's outsiders looking in who perceive it in a certain way isn't it but it's it's definitely it's blood and thunder out there in Africa, isn't it? The football's very kind of tough. Yeah, no, 100%. And even like down to kind of the, the really low local level. So I've only had a couple of experiences of it, but we went, I went out to Sierra Leone when I was 16, I think 16, 17, uh, with a couple of friends. We did some football coaching. And while we were there, we we're like, let's organize. Like, we met someone who was manager of a second division tie side called Sheffield United, uh, of course. And at the time, that was when like my team, Reading and Sheffield United, had had a couple of battles and stuff. So they offered to play like a pre season friendly where they'd get their first team in the kind of the village we were in, which is right next to the airport. They were like, why don't you just get get a group of these of kind of guys from that village to form a team and then we'll play like a pre season friendly just to kind of have a bit of fun. So we're like, okay, this this sounds great. We 
rummage through kind of like where you get all the like people that like football clubs have donated lots of kits so steve cabber um also played for sierra and it's or like could represent sierra i don't know if he ever played but he donated a couple of watford shirts but then me and another mate we found the reading kits like at the back of this thing we're like this is perfect it's a reading sheffield united kind of fixture um to do some trials get a team together to go and play and I've, it's the hardest game of football I think I've ever played. Um, the pitch was terrible, but it's just the, the kind of the physicality and like it was a pre it was a friendly and it was just meant to be like a little bit of fun. But no one wanted to lose, and they didn't want to lose. Like the, the Sheffield United players didn't want to lose. Our guys that we had got together that were quite young, kind of like teenagers, early twenties, they desperately didn't want to lose, and they were super super competitive. And I was like, yeah, this is this is slightly different to something I'm used to. And I then went a couple of years later, went to Uganda and played just kind of, we just had like a little kickabout on a field with like a couple of kind of these, we were like volunteering and there was like some builders and they were like, let's just have a kickabout. It was just super, super competitive. I was like, we're literally just having a kickabout. But if you miss a chance, everyone starts berating you or like you foul someone, like whoever's been told to be the referee gets surrounded and stuff. I was like, there's just this will to win. And I think we see it in the tournament. And I've always said to kind of people that you have to, basically throw everything you think about kind of individual talent of these players that you know just completely out the window when you watch AFCON because you'll find like Cape Verde a perfect example of this where uh, you've got the guy at the back I can't I always forget his name uh the Irish kid mm -hmm. who plays for Shamrock Rovers and you're like he plays for Shamrock Rovers but he'll go out there and he'll man mark Mo Salah for the whole game and he'll play <laughs> The best one of the best games of his life and you're like but he plays for shamrock rovers in the <laughs> irish league against Mo Salah and liverpool it doesn't matter like these guys there, there's this kind of like willingness to win and like you said it's kind of played at such a high tempo and a high pace that you just it just feels so difficult for kind of these star players to really have an impact on the game and sometimes they can and that's what kind of for me elevates them to that next level like with Mane in the previous tournament for Senegal he elevates himself to that next level because he's able to overcome what is a really difficult tournament and win it um which is what Salah is trying to do and it's so difficult because you need that collective to get behind you and I think the one thing I find as well is like players are not afraid to try things that most European coaches would be livid at them trying like they'll try the back heel they'll try bebe will shoot from 40 yards from a free kick like you're yeah, not going to yeah. be allowed to do that in kind of a more structured rigid european football system but over there it's like well this is it's kind of the game's meant to be exciting and entertaining and that's how it's played like every winger if you watch the tournament you just feel like every winger their first thought is i want to beat this guy and i want to do a skill to get past him whereas you just we kind of have lost that a little bit i feel in kind of some of our kind of european football where it's about everything's all about the result it's not always about the entertainment side of things and i think we have kind of you then get into the knockout stage and it gets a little bit more difficult and teams are a little bit more wary and that's just natural but you still have those individual moments and players that like want to show their flair and they may not have any end product but it's entertainment and the entertainment factor is just so so high and i think people have seen that especially this tournament i've noticed a lot of people talking about how much they've enjoyed so many of the games and we've seen some ridiculous results in yeah, this yeah. tournament between like there's games that you feel like oh, i don't really want to watch that one because it's like mauritania against someone you're like well mauritania haven't got a chance but then they go and beat algeria and you're like no this is this is why you have to watch every afcon game because you just don't know what's going to happen yeah i think that uh, this uh tournament and the last one there has been a definite qualitative improvement in the in the football as well uh that that's made an incredible difference to the profile of the tournament for me because i've i've thoroughly enjoyed watching the games uh this time but i'd say like uh three or four tournaments ago it could be a bit little bit there were good games but it could be a little bit skittish and the quality wasn't kind of as consistent there seems to be uh, a greater consistency now and, and it's interesting you see the big nations like most you know, most Salah and Egypt they haven't been very co cohesive but I think there's kind of an innate patriotism in these smaller nations isn't there and, and because football is one of the few real pleasures that, that they have they they really celebrate and 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 work harder than other sides and and that's really shown in in this tournament too uh so anyway going into legacy i mean the the african cup of nation uh, has, has created a legacy all of its own i mean obviously the great players great teams what what do you think uh the, the african uh cup of nations has given 
but well, yeah, I think it's it's that's such a good question. I think it's kind of it's a really nice way to frame the question as well to be like, what is it given to football? Like, what has like people given to the Africa Cup of Nations? I think for me, it's it's kind of it's been really difficult for the Africa Cup of Nations to kind of assert itself as a respected tournament, not inside Africa, but even in some parts of Africa, it's not a respected tournament. And people don't see it as a respected tournament, but kind of worldwide, I just don't feel like it always gets the respect it deserves as a tournament. And I think it's just because it's not just about football, it's about the whole perception of the continent as a whole as being underdeveloped, under ed, uneducated, all this sort of stuff without realising it's not like that at all. And it just takes visiting one African state. That's all you really need to do is visit one African country to realise that all your preconceptions are completely wrong anyway. Mm. Um, it's just, there's always that, like, Africa is not a it's not a country, it's a continent. It's like everywhere is different. And you kind of, you know it on the head there about kind of these smaller nations having such passion for football um and that's for me is the legacy of the tournament in its own right is that these smaller nations every two years get the chance to compete against these big teams they get the chance to kind of make history and do that sort of stuff and because it happens every two years it just changes so quickly that you have like last tournament you had comoros who are just a fantastic story they're just not here mozam um uh, <laughs> So in Madagascar, they were a fantastic team to watch a couple of years ago. They're not here anymore. So the kind of the flows of teams that can qualify and can't qualify. And as it has expanded, teams have found ways to get in and be competitive. And once they get in, like you look at Equatorial Guinea, and they're for me, they're one of the weirdest stories of the African Cup of Nations kind of legacy. And the fact that they obviously host the tournament twice, once with Gabon, then on their own. They get lots of players in from kind of the Spanish third or fourth divisions. Like they're very much kind of reaching out to the diaspora that they can get. And you're looking at them and thinking, okay, how is that going to translate into the domestic game in Equatorial Guinea? Like, is that going to help? Or is it once this generation of players has gone, are they going to be able to keep finding players in the diaspora to kind of fuel this this talent that they clearly have? And they're just one of those epitomes of low level players that you consider lower level just outperforming themselves every single time and i think the legacy is that kind of yeah you come to get we come together every two years we have the big names and we chuck in a couple of minnows and we just kind of let the chaos kind of ensue we just enjoy the ridiculous storylines that come out which is you know a, a large team's gonna there's gonna be upsets a large team's gonna fall out players that we'll probably never do anything again we'll have this incredible tournament like Emilio and Sue it's just he had the most ridiculous tournament but he's 34 like he's not going to go on to do anything else now like mm -hmm. he's very much at the end of his career but he gets to like he's the captain of Equatorial Guinea and he leads from the front and stuff like that so for me that's that's kind of one one big legacy and then another is you've seen what I've seen is this massive transition over the tournament is just kind of we moved away from what used to be a very domestic tournament in terms of players came from domestic leagues and we're now very much it's an international tournament with players coming from all over the world and it's interesting in my mind to see how the domestic game in africa reacts and adapts to this because the talent drain at, at such a young age is massive where players will leave really really young to go to europe um Asia or even South America now they will move around at a young age because financially it just makes sense for them and some of these like domestic clubs can't can't compete or they've realized that the best way they can compete is to sell these players for for funds and stuff so I'm really interested to see what the international internationalization of the tournament does to the domestic game uh, on the continent because there's still some fantastic teams and fantastic players that play in all these things and we we still do get to see them every now and then like you look at kind of South Africa they they are very much a domestic side they have a couple of international or like non-south african based players but most of them will play in the psl um and it's just really really fascinating to see how they compete and it's just nice isn't it every two years you just you discover new teams you discover new players that you never heard of you, you might not hear of them again for another two years and then you remember oh yeah this guy so yeah i think it has many different kind of legacies and kind of effects on the game and what it's given the game but I feel like this tournament especially, it feels like a moment where people are really respecting the tournament for the entertainment value. 
Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, it's it's not perfect, but it's all the better for it. You know, what I mean, yeah. it's so much more enjoyable because there there are and there's variety, different styles of play. Uh, you you tend to see in other kind of tournaments, it's playing the same throughout football, really playing the same mm. way. Uh, you know, pass it across. This teams aren't afraid to launch the ball forward. It's it, it, yeah. it's it's diverse in style. It's fantastic. So, uh, and I'm looking forward to a few more shocks in this tournament. I hope it, I hope it continues in the vein. Yeah, it does. Absolutely. Mate, they, th thank you for talking to us, Ben. The, the book's titled The African Cup of Nations, The History of an Underappreciated Tournament. Uh, listeners, it's a really thorough examination of one of football's lesser documented competitions. So, so where's this fantastic book available, Ben? Yeah, so it's available all the usual places. Uh, if you go to the pitch publishing website, you can kind of pick where you prefer to get your books from. Because <laughs> I know some people don't want to give uh, Elon any money, but you can get it from other places as well. So, yeah, anywhere you like, I guess. Oh, thanks. Thanks for being a terrific guest, Ben. And good luck with the book. Uh, join us next time on Football Geeks podcast for more football chat, guys. See you soon.